of uh, the, the way this lecture seems to fit into the larger theme of the course is the <coughs> idea of the word global. We talked about it last time and a couple times before that. But in this lecture, we have three sites uh, that comply with the primary theme of this lecture. Uh, this lecture is all about how Europe and Asia trade, how European and Asian trade uh, changed everything that we came into contact with. And this is a familiar topic. We've been talking about trade and, and the way cultural influences travel across these trade routes. Um, and I, by now, it should be very clear that this thing that we call globalization as this new thing, supposedly, is not, not only is it not new, but arguably what we're experiencing now is not as significant as what has happened in the past. Uh, historians, in particular, focus on uh, the late colonial period as one where the boundaries of nation states were far more permeable because of the domination of European nation states and European powers so that arguably, in terms of mobility and exchange, uh, that that was a much more significant moment of globalization than what we've experienced in the last three decades. Um, people differ on that, but it's, it's a useful thing to look at. <clears throat> One of the ways, uh, the best ways to understand the degree of connectivity is to look at what it takes to disconnect. And we have a beautiful example, uh, the, the fourth and final example, uh, in Japan. Japan uh, disconnects. The first three examples are three uh, sites that are uh, deeply connected um, in the, around the Mediterranean. And then the fourth example is the counterexample. One of the central themes of the course is influenced by uh, the writings of James C. Scott, in particular, his books, um, Seen Like a State, which is a brilliant uh, work of anthropology that has uh, really shaken a lot of understandings of architecture and planning uh, and history. Uh, but the more specific book is, is more recent, The Art of Not Being Governed, which looks at what it takes for societies to disconnect and to isolate themselves. Why would a society want to isolate itself away from the global connections uh, with all its wonderful benefits? Well, now that gets us back to the death and destruction that sometimes comes with that. The, uh, as referenced before, the creative destruction of, pro of human progress in the name of progress. <clears throat> and so we'll come uh, at the end of the lecture, if, we, if our machines support it, we'll end up back here in Nagasaki Harbor where the Dutch were the only Europeans allowed to have any contact whatsoever with the entire population of Japan. And they could only do it across this tenuous bridge from the island to uh, the mainland. So talk about the architecturalization of these global forces. Beautiful example right there. So <clears throat> here we go. Our first site is the 1333 Alhambra in Granada, Spain. At this point, uh, Spain is in the hands of the Moors. Uh, the entire Iberian Peninsula uh, was conquered in the 8th century and became almost entirely the realm of uh, Northern African Islam uh, and Arab Islam uh, when, well, we'll get to that story, so in future weeks, so I'm not going to say anything more. But we're zooming in on Granada, Spain, and this hilltop fortress that is the Alhambra. First and foremost, it was a fortification in the 13th century called the Red Fort because of its red walls. And the as uh, the various competitions occurred on the peninsula, the Islamic rulers uh, grew in power and then receded in power internal conflicts within uh, the, the uh, local uh, sultans of uh, the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, 
created opportunities for Christian uh, forces to make inroads. Uh, but it's extremely complicated, as we see, as we're going to see increasingly as we move back in time. It is not a clash of civilizations. It is not Muslim versus Christian. Uh, one of the great complexities of this story is that there were some local Christian leaders who allied with the Muslim forces in order to defeat a competitor. And these types of uh, complex alliances were constantly shifting, and it was anything but a clash of civilizations. Similarly, there was no... Uh, there was no uh, absolute death to the inter infidel attitude on the part of the Muslims. They lived perfectly happily, and they were perfectly tolerant, not perfectly tolerant, but they were largely relatively tolerant of enclaves of Jews and Christians living within uh, Moorish uh, Al-Andalus, which was the name of this uh, region. And... Um, it, in, in contrast, it's the Christians that when they come to power, they start by negotiating. They start by saying, oh, yeah, sure, you can stay, you Muslims and you Jews. But then by the time they reconquer um, the peninsula, and this brings us right up to the story uh, of Monday, when uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, the marriage alliance, um, between Aragon and Castilla, uh, when they finally uh, defeated the last vestiges of uh, Muslim Spain, they immediately, well, almost in the same breath, they uh, evicted the Jews and took control of all of their holdings. And there was this vast diaspora of Jewish merchants and traders who went to places like Antwerp, uh, Bruges, uh, to Constantinople, to Venice, uh, to other places around, uh, when it was Istanbul by then, but they went all over the place and participated in the flourishing of commerce and banking in those locations at the great uh, loss to Spain and Portugal. Um, and there was also a deal struck with Muslims left behind, but within 10 years that deal was broken and there was a great deal of intolerance of any Muslims left on the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and we see that struggle playing out uh, on the territory of the Alhambra. We'll uh, get to the palace of the Spanish king uh, built in the midst of the Muslim enclave of the Alhambra as a way, again, of displacing the power of the Muslims. Uh, so using architecture... Uh, as we saw in Mexico City and elsewhere, to literally physically displace uh, the former power. In this case, the incredible achievement that was the Alhambra uh, was too incredible to just get rid of. Um, and so, to their credit, they kept most of the fabulous uh, fabric of the Alhambra intact and simply didn't allow people to visit, and it was kept largely a secret um, so that people wouldn't know. So to quickly move through this example, um, focusing on the key bits, there are, are very distinct districts. There are three distinct districts. This was a garrison, and when Ferdinand and Isabella uh, said yes to Christopher Columbus, this is where they were. They had just... Uh, a few weeks earlier, conquered the Alhambra, and this is where they uh, granted uh, uh, Christopher Columbus the, the, the money, the investment he needed to go stumbling off the edge of the globe, which is ironic because this was also a place of high scientific learning, uh, as was much uh, every Islamic capital made it a point of pride to uh, venerate and create libraries and, and zones of scholarship for the ancient sciences and arts. And the, the reason we have had access to them during the Renaissance is to a large extent because they had been preserved and translated in the libraries of the Islamic world. And so the scientific understanding that would have uh, clearly uh, helped uh, the 
the, port, the Spanish to understand why they weren't going to get to the Spice Islands was available in the library, uh, ironically, in this location. So the Alhambra uh, is this remarkable uh, accomplishment. Uh, and we're going to, apparently our slides are telling us to dive right into the, uh, the material surface qualities. There is, um, in Islamic art, uh, there is a, uh, a, it's forbidden to show the form of Muhammad, uh, something that you're probably familiar with if you've been paying attention to the news. But different uh, Islamic societies have interpreted uh, this, these regulations uh, at different levels of strictness. Uh, but what is true overall is that there is a favoring of uh, abstract design over figural arts. Um, we'll see exceptions to that rule uh, next week. But the, in general, uh, it is the intellectual appeal of words and inscriptions uh, in the abstract that uh, is venerated as a way of touching and communing with the divine. And in the same, in the same stroke of the chisel, it is also a way of, of removing the solidity of the surface of the architecture and creating this shimmering light phenomena uh, that combined with water and the capturing of light from different angles that is exemplified in this image. So, um, and so it's uh, highly elaborated at the core of all of this pattern making is the text. And the text is further abstracted into these um, very complex geometric forms. There was also a control of experience. As we move through this, eventually we'll encounter a plan and we'll see that rather than, as we've seen in the axial visual orders uh, of um, the Baroque uh, St. Peter's and Versailles and Paris, Haussmann's Paris, this is a matter of local axial views that are constantly shifting. You move along an axis, you're confronted with a threshold, you pass through the threshold, and you turn. You are reoriented, and you have the next orientation. And so rather than an all-consuming uh, uh, order that is legible from above and from every surface, from every position, you have this complex uh, shifting of axes and thresholds and views uh, in, a, in a complex manner. Here we see uh, one of the uh, seats of the, of the king, of the sultan. Here we have uh, the court of the lions. This was at the center of uh, the hall of justice and the uh, throne room. Um, and it was activated by water. We don't see it in this view uh, because the water has been stopped. But one of the great achievements of the Alhambra was, despite its location at the top of a hill, the river Dara was, was diverted and the water was channeled in a way that fed this very high position, and that fed water down to the, the people living below the Alhambra, below the hill. And this was a remarkable technological achievement in keeping with uh, what really was seen as the basis of the success of Islam in the Iberian Peninsula, which was this advanced agricultural technology that involved the control and management of water resources. Um, Islam coming from the Arabian Peninsula, and we'll look at that, um, a, a very arid, dry place, the, the use of water, shade, fruit trees in gardens was a technique of offering uh, the, the faithful an experience of heaven on earth prior to death and uh, going to heaven. And so the play of water, the control of water in the creation of these gardens was a fundamental, uh, at the core of this, uh, of this accomplishment, of what was attempt, being attempted here. Here we see uh, more views of how even the most solid structural elements, 
here are, are dematerialized by these intricate surface patterns and behaviors. And we'll be looking at these very specific hanging arches motifs uh, whenever it comes up in the slides. Well, here it is. And um, looking up into the dome, you see this extremely complex pattern of what are called mukarnanas. And uh, I'm going to write that down because you don't have, unless it's on a slide. So the mukarnas is one of the key elements of this, uh, this architecture that makes it very uh, foreign to most uh, Western eyes. And here we see this great elaboration of the Mukarnas uh, in, this, in, the, in the play of light. And so uh, this is artificially lit, but the windows uh, would have created a very carefully controlled play of light um, in the palace of the lions adjacent to the court of the lions. So the water is let into the courtyard. The fountains activate that water. Uh, the light comes in, reflects off that water, and it creates the shimmering light effect all around the court. And then you move into the Hall of the Lions, and you get a similar effect, but now uh, achieved without water, but in stone. But it's a similar aspect. And what this shimmering aspect is attempting to achieve, again, is this uh, sense of the divine order uh, that is very much uh, a part of uh, the mystical experience in Islam, that it is not a stagnant universe. It is not a static universe. It is a dynamic universe. And their scientific understanding uh, led them to support this conception of the universe, that there was this highly dynamic interplay of natural forces that was set in motion by God. And so there were ongoing heated debates uh, throughout this period, these centuries, uh, both in European, uh, Muslim Europe and Muslim uh, Middle East, between, uh, and this is familiar to us today, is it science or is it God? And they uh, did a fairly effective job leading the way for Western thinkers on this topic of pointing out that God creates the heavens and the earth. God sets it in motion, but that motion operates according to rules and patterns that are discernible by humans. And so this was uh, the debate at the time, uh, never quite settled, but this was a very cosmopolitan uh, society that uh, embraced uh, that these things were not mutually exclusive. They were open to uh, other points of view. They uh, welcomed scholars from the West. Um, and as, as uh, luscious as the interiors are, the exteriors are kept very plain. Uh, and so that contrast also is part of how uh, this order is created by this architecture. And so you have the luscious gardens, uh, the flow of water, uh, these tight spaces that um, will pretty soon, I hope, be explained by a plan. Uh, the slides were totally shuffled. Um, so what you see here is that uh, often you have this totally enclosed, inward-looking space. But at the end of the line, you then have a view out. You have a framed view out across the landscape. And so this is another way in which this architecture operated as a machine for understanding and controlling and managing the relationship between God, humans, and the vast territory of nature. And the sultan in this privileged position sitting in the Alhambra had access to this experience of luscious nature activated by the forces of water and light, and then at the end of the axis, the framed view of the mirador, uh, which is the platform for viewing across the territory as a place of control, a privileged place of control for the ruler. And it's the power of the ruler's gaze. All things are knowable and seeable from this position, uh, this privileged position of the sultan. And so there's this series of 
framed views moving forward. Um, here we go. And so here we see the Court of the Lions um, and the Tribunal, the Hall of Justice, uh, the, hall, uh, the Hall of Lions, the Court of Lions, and then this uh, water course which leads um, to the main, the main event uh, at the end and the viewing platforms. Um, and you can see this in context where the view would be out across the landscape in this perspective. And the organization of these spaces around the courtyards, it makes it very clear that these are not, this is not an object-oriented architecture. This is an architecture of space. These are framed, ordered spaces. The architecture is the framing. The buildings uh, frame these open spaces, and these spaces themselves are the architecture. And so you have... Uh, a new richness to this idea of formal spatial arrangements. It is the form of the buildings that frame and define the spaces of the architecture, the primary spaces of the architecture. These are not, it's not the Burj Khalifa sitting there on the horizon as an object. It is uh, an architecture of space. It still it had that sense of objectness uh, on the hill overlooking uh, the Valley of Granada, uh, with the backdrop of the Sierra Nevada, which often had uh, snow on the mountains. Here we see a depiction of the formal order uh, as seen from above. Ar architects tend to want to identify some pure geometry, uh, and we always find it. Um, it's it's like a mystical thing that architects do. But this middle one is more of the, the true reality, I believe. This is the one that makes sense, that there are these shifting axes where you experience moments of pivot and reorientation. And the overall order is not something anyone would experience from within the architecture. Whether you turn 90 degrees or 94 degrees, you experience it as a turn, as an orthogonal turn. And so um, it's important to take such diagrams with a grain of salt. Um, architects do not always prioritize human experience first and foremost. And so you have, uh, here you have the Court of the Lions and uh, the, the Hall of Justice where Islamic law, that was Sharia law, the Sultan would uh, rule. Um, here we have the Generalife complex, which was like a summer palace, not really, more of a rural retreat for the Sultan, um, where it followed a similar ordering principle and set of forms, but it was more open and set in a larger garden. And this was a series of gardens stepping down the hill, and it was like a retreat away. And again, this is where the characteristics of paradise uh, were to be directly experienced um, the, hall, the court of lions uh, with the water, the Alhambra on the hill, uh, this decomposition, dematerialization of the surface, uh, the hall of justice with the judges uh, holding forth, uh, hearing cases. Uh, and this was seen as one of the challenges of effective rule was to always... Uh, uh, order the kingdom with wisdom and strength and to keep people, have, give people a sense that the sultan is taking care of this balance between uh, God, man, and nature. Um, we should soon be getting some slides showing uh, after the final defeat, um, the last uh, bastion, uh, the Iberian Peninsula was conquered by the mid-13th century, and the, uh, the Muslim uh, enclave held on for another uh, over 100 years as a vassal state of Ferdinand III until the tolerance for the Muslim presence simply could not uh, hold. And they, they, the Spaniards marched on Granada and, uh, after a long siege, uh, defeated. 
um, the last bastion of Islam in Iberia. And there was this very powerful push by the Spanish king, Charles V, who later became the Holy Roman Emperor. Let's move on to that. And he uh, pushed uh, to reestablish the Roman roots of the Iberian Peninsula. When Rome had conquered most of the Mediterranean and, and established its order across most of the region. And Charles V had a, a, a very strong project to reunify all of Europe under Habsburg uh, rule. Uh, he was the Holy Roman Emperor. He was the King of Spain. He was uh, getting huge amounts of silver flowing in from the Americas at this point. And so what he created was this uh, scholastically pure uh, Renaissance structure, totally symmetric in every way, uh, with a purity of form. It was a, a wedding cake uh, of textbook Renaissance form without the life. You know, it didn't have the gardens of the Palazzi of of Italy. Uh, it didn't have the warmth of the uh, other uh, constructions of the period, but it was very clearly a statement of the purity that its job was to rival the mastery demonstrated by the Alhambra. Uh, but it, it leaves much to be desired, especially in juxtaposition with the Alhambra. Um, that made sense in the former order. The um, Black Death came through in the 14th century uh, and killed uh, arguably up to one-third of the European population. Still doesn't win the prize from last week's lecture. Um, but we now move quickly from the Alhambra uh, across the Mediterranean. We're going to tilt and look up at the Mediterranean for a moment and descend on Istanbul, formerly known as Constantinople, uh, the Eastern uh, Church, the Eastern, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, that um, for centuries uh, held out against uh, all competitors from its fortress stronghold uh, here on the Golden Horn that connects the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. Uh, and this is where the Topkape Palace and our next site is, um, is Suleimanye, the Magnificent uh, Mosque Complex in Istanbul, formerly known as Constantinople. In 1453, Mehmed II conquers uh, Constantinople, which... Uh, armies had been attempting to do for over a thousand years. And he finally breaks through and conquers uh, Constantinople after being weakened for centuries. The um, Suleiman, So Mehmed II is the one who conquers Istanbul. And, uh, but the one who really consolidates the power is Suleiman the Magnificent. To speak of his mosque and the complex around the mosque is to speak of Suleiman's coulier, or it is often shortened just as Suleimanie. And so that's the name we're using. It's Suleiman's the Magnificent's coulier. Uh, which we refer to as Suleimanie. It's not just the mosque. It's the complex around the mosque. And this I'm presenting as uh, if the last, if the Alhambra was a machine for maintaining the order between heaven and earth, uh, this is a machine for, of Islamic urbanism, of uh, benefiting the social welfare of the people. It is a machine that was applied, it's a, it's a formulation of architecture and urban formation that was applied throughout the Islamic world, where if you were wealthy and you wanted to be venerated after death, you were obligated 
to invest in a complex of this nature that would not just uh, it, would, it would have a mosque, it would have schools, social services, a soup kitchen, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, services for the benefits of the poor, both physically and spiritually. And as a consolation, or as a prize, you get to place your tomb in a favorable location. When the, the faithful bow to pray, uh, to Mecca, they are praying uh, past the prayer wall, the Mirab prayer wall, and past your grave. So they are simultaneously praying to Mecca, and uh, uh, if you would like to believe so, they are also praying to you, venerating you somehow. And so here we have the Suleimani Mosque. If we were going in chronological order, you would immediately recognize this as being uh, a form that you recognize from the Eastern Christian Church of Hagia Sophia, which is just a kilometer away. Uh, that became the model, that Christian church became the model uh, for the grand mosque constructions of subsequent centuries. It was very directly an issue of com competition. Uh, the Muslim builders were always challenged to achieve and surpass the triumphant construction that was Hagia Sophia. And uh, the architect for Suleiman the Magnificent was Sinan, S-I-N-A-N. -N. Sinan was the most successful architect of um, this history. And he was prolific. He built hundreds of uh, mosques, complexes, civic works, uh, working his way up through the hierarchy. Uh, at this point, uh, the, uh, the Muslim society operated on a system of Dev uh, Shirme, uh, which meant that the trusted administrators of the Islamic uh, order, the government, government uh, the trusted administrators of the sultan were all uh, the offspring of kidnapped peoples uh, who were often uh, castrated so that uh, they could not reproduce, but some were allowed to reproduce. But it was, it was a system of kidnapping, often of Christian uh, peoples, villagers uh, captured uh, from their villages near the coastline, and brought in uh, as slaves, but with a social hierarchy and, and an opportunity for advancement. Uh, the most famous example are the Janissary guards, the elite stormtroopers of the Muslim, Muslim forces. Um, and this is the, uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, that uh, is occupying and taking over this entire region. Um, at some point, we'll see that on a map. But the, uh, the Ottomans are advancing across the landscape through the use of these uh, kidnapped soldiers and uh, administrators, including the architect Sinan, who um, takes the, the DNA, the basic outline of Hagia Sophia, the Christian church from the 6th century, and is here uh, developing it further in this remarkable... Uh, construction. Uh, the One of the highest domes, uh, uh, Hagia Sophia, uh, surpasses uh, the previous domes, only to be surpassed by Florence Cathedral, um, that we'll be looking at in a moment. Uh, but the, the, it achieves this through these massive piers uh, that is op opposing these piers. There's a structural problem of thrust that we'll be looking at, that any dome or arch creates a, a, a lateral force of thrust that needs to be resisted. One strategy is through massive piers. Where that's not enough, you back up those massive piers with further structures that distribute the forces outward in layer upon layer of supporting buttresses. And we'll see that in Hagia Sophia. We'll see it in the Florence Cathedral. We'll see it in the Gothic architecture. And finally, we'll see it in the Pantheon. Uh, but it, 
the effect is that it achieves this incredible height uh, and allowing also, by, the, by concentrating the forces through the dome, down into this ring, and out through these four pendentives, down to the four piers, it creates the opportunity to open up these arches to allow light in. The remarkable innovation of the Hagia Sophia is that it puts these windows around uh, the ring at the base of the dome. This was a, a remarkably risky undertaking, and the dome did, in fact, fall. But here, by the time we get to Sinan's Suleimani Mosque, uh, he, they, it is a well-understood structural practice, and they do it with great confidence. Sinan is, is very boastful about uh, the mountains could be blown over, but this dome will continue to stand. And so um, the forces come down through this main dome into half domes, and then out to these other uh, arcaded domes. Here you see them stepping down the hillside. And it's in this uh, proliferation of structural support to the central dome, it is both physically and metaphorically uh, a diagram of the social order, where uh, there is a central focal point, which is uh, God and the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and then there's this, there are the supporting hierarchy, both structurally and socially, of uh, where you work back to the schools. This location uh, has actually four madrasa schools, which are schools for the teaching of young boys, uh, the Quran. And uh, there are two additional schools, which are the hadith schools, that are for younger children learning uh, the practices during Muhammad's life. And so here you see a plan view at the central dome, you see the, the puncturing openings, punctured openings of the windows. Uh, these four octagonal structures, which uh, the weight of these structures help the piers to withstand the lateral forces. The more weight you put on top of something, the less likely it is it will be toppled over to the side. And so this is very much a, a puzzle of managing those structural forces and bringing them to the ground, uh, transforming those uh, lateral loads of the thrust of the central dome, managing them, taming them, and bringing them to the ground. You gather them together at the upper levels. You do your main uh, job of, of resisting those forces and bringing them out to the farthest, uh, the farthest of the fabric because of the moment of inertia the squared element of the moment of inertia, I can say that, right, to you guys? Um, and you bring them out so far that you can now confidently puncture the bottom level so that uh, you can have uh, passageways, windows, uh, occupiable spaces, and a permeable fabric of the larger structure. And so um, it ends up with this elaborate wedding cake structure and supported by all the, the, the structure for the social services around the base. You, can, you even have flying buttresses um, coming off to uh, allow so, uh, Sinan to open up the windows at the base of the dome with greater confidence. And so you can see the concentration of mass here but then further brings it down. The location of this cut is uh, concealing these massive piers at the corners. This is cut through the soft middle of the donut rather than these solid uh, piers at the corners. You have these minarets that uh, if you are uh, an important person, you get to have one minaret. Uh, if you're a prince or princess, you get to have two minarets on your, uh, the, the mosque devoted to your tomb and your rule. But this was the um, Suleiman the Magnificent. He gets four minarets, tower. These are the, the prayer towers where the call to prayer uh, in Islam. Is anyone Muslim? Who's Muslim? Um, great. Um, so the call to prayer 
five times a day, and um, you face Mecca and pray, and the call to prayer is sounded in these days uh, from the top of a minaret. Um, now it's probably a megaphone. Um, but this incredible uh, spatial experience, the colors, again, like the Alhambra, this uh, dematerialization of the surface, this denial of the solidity of these piers by articulating them both formally and by uh, dematerializing the surface with these rich mosaic. <clears throat> and these medallion patterns are script, are based on Arabic script of uh, verses of the Quran. <clears throat> And here you see uh, the inverted arches of the Mukarnas, treatment of the capitals, uh, the striped masonry of, of the arches, uh, which are based on a Romanesque practice, uh, and the scriptural panel. Again, you have denotation in the surface. Um, the mirab wall, this is when we face Mecca to pray, we face the mirab. Um, the, and this is the mimar where the Friday uh, afternoon sermon is delivered from the top of this tower. Sometimes it's quite elaborate, sometimes it's quite modest. Uh, but here, of course, it would be quite elaborate. And it makes its presence known on the landscape of, of the peninsula in Istanbul. The uh, mausoleum of Suleiman the Magnificent is located in the gardens on the grounds uh, of the mosque. The madrasa schools uh, continue to be a very important element of education uh, uh, throughout the Islamic world. Uh, the Over the doorway is the profession uh, of, of uh, the affirmation. Um, there is no God but God, Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, which is um, recited every time. Uh, the comparison of Mehmed II, when he first conquers Constantinople, renames it Istanbul, and establishes the Kulier uh, complex of the victory of Fatih. And he is very conscious of two things. One is the competition with the Renaissance world uh, across the Mediterranean. Uh, there were very close connections uh, between Istanbul uh, and traders in Venice in particular, and Genoa. And so there was a, a hyper-consciousness of what was going on elsewhere in the Mediterranean at the time. And there was a need to compete. So this is the mosque set in this vast garden that is uh, compulsively symmetric, very driven to create this geometric order that would have uh, made it the arrival of the Renaissance constructions of the time. Uh, Ninety years later, when Suleiman uh, takes the throne and builds his great mosque, the building sites are more limited, and there is not a flat space for uh, such a large construction. And so he has to construct terraces on a hilltop, one of the high hills of Istanbul. Uh, and he creates this elaborate terrace structure and squeezes this complex in. It causes some asymmetry because of the uh, topographic challenges of the site. Um, but in the structures that are holding up this platform, there's an opportunity. You can see here the, the madrasa stepping down the hill for um, stables. Uh, the caravanserai, which is something, a caravanserai is a station point along trade routes where traders can stop for the night, rest their camels or horses. In this case, uh, it was just a hospice, a hostel, uh, an overnight stay for traders, um, a place to refresh, and so um, a place to pray. Uh, and so it was supporting this mobility uh, from town to town. And this would be characteristic of the mosque complexes throughout the uh, Muslim world and its trade routes. And the spread of Islam 
uh, from the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, this is in the 18th century. You see it spread across North Africa, across uh, Persia, modern-day Iran, uh, and then through the Ottoman Empire, which is spreading. And is, uh, in some ways, this the maps uh, presented as a kind of a clash of civilizations. Uh, there are stories throughout the histories of Ottoman armies marching on, on uh, Vienna uh, and the threat, the Ottoman hordes. Uh, but the story is more complex, of course. Um, the, and here we take a quick look. Can we see it? At Cairo. Um, Cairo is one of the sites that we would have dug into much more deeply if we uh, hadn't had the snow day. But just one such site, this is a similar complex of a very wealthy uh, patron of this complex where there's a hospital, a school, uh, a mosque, uh, a caravanserai, um, hostel, uh, etc. but placed in the fabric of, of Cairo. From here, we're going to take a quick little jaunt. Another one of the sites that we would have looked at much more deeply is Venice. And I'm sorry to say that Venice is um, getting short shrift here. And uh, we're just going to stop in to point out that contrary to this clash of civilizations uh, caricature, uh, Venice benefited hugely from the sense that, oh, you can't trade with the Ottoman Empire. Um, and Venice actually successfully maintains over several centuries the source of its wealth uh, is that it is uh, a machine of trade. It's uh, basically a swamp that was built as a city with a system of canals and developing the shipyards and the boat building capacity and the merchant infrastructure, the warehouses, the uh, sailing, sailing navigational know-how to dominate trade around the Mediterranean. If you go to the Venice Biennale, that is set in the, uh, the shipyards that uh, created all the ships. Um, the wealth that accumulates in Venice is because uh, until uh, the Portuguese uh, give an alternative, all of the spices that we've been talking about this whole time come through Venice. And so the spices come through Venice, uh, the wealth accrues, uh, in the spice trade, they have a virtual monopoly, and their trading partners are Cairo, uh, first and foremost, and Constantinople until it becomes Istanbul. And the, when the Ottomans take over Constantinople, the trade with Venice barely blinks. Uh, but at the same time, the rest of Europe is dismayed by the loss of Constantinople, and um, which happens in 1453, uh, and it, uh, to a large extent, inspires the Portuguese and the Spanish to seek out those spice islands, an alternative route, so that some of the wealth that's been accumulating in Venice uh, for all these years starts to accrue to them. <clears throat> and Venice is this remarkable uh, entity. It's not a monarchy. It is a city-state run by a, a doge uh, under the, uh, and a council, uh, which shifts over the years. But they also create these enclaves. It's like another version of the trading post colonialism that we saw with the Portuguese and the Spanish. So they really set the model for that. Uh, and the wealth and luxury accumulates here. Venice was the sponsor of the Fourth Crusade. And, what, uh, and these are the, this is one of the lines that they captured from Constantinople. But wait a minute, why would a crusade march against Christian Constantinople? Well, they were on their way to the Holy Land. They really did intend at the beginning to recapture the Holy Land. But uh, they had a problem with finance. And the financiers in Venice said, we will finance your escapade in the Holy Land but you have to recapture this Balkan city first of Durazzo. And so they said, okay, we'll go capture Durazzo. They go to Durazzo, capture Durazzo. They run into a man who says, 
listen, I'm really the rightful heir and ruler of Constantinople. If you conquer Constantinople, I will reunify the Eastern and Western Church, Rome and Constantinople, Latin, Christian, Rome, under the Pope, Greek, Christian, Constantinople, under the Patriarch, and we can finally reunify Christendom. And so they said, okay, let's go do that. So they um, end up sacking Constantinople, destroying the city, and bringing back these lions to their financiers um, in Venice. Too good of a story to pass up. But we're going to pop over the Italian peninsula and just stop in at Florence for a quick look at the Florence Cathedral. Continuing this theme of uh, structural innovation, we finally get to that dome, that dome that was uh, so influential uh, from this point forward. So this dome is an impossible dome. And I say and it wasn't just impossible at the time. People, including engineers at MIT, are still struggling to figure out how the heck that thing is staying up. It's this remarkable achievement. They built the uh, plan of the church uh, uh, with ridiculous ambitions. Uh, it went from this to this to this. And they, they set out this position of these piers, again, with the four piers. No one had ever built a dome this large. And yet they said, well, I'm sure someone will figure out how to do it in the end. And um, so they had a contest in 1418. They said, okay, uh, you have six weeks. Bring us a wooden model showing how you would make a dome. And for most people entering this competition, uh, there really was only one way because the Dome Builders Guild, the, the, con the Contractors Guild, said this is the this is the only geometry we will allow. Um, you can build a dome any way you want, but this is the only shape. This is the only shape we will we will allow. And it was a much shallower dome than uh, than Filippo Brunelleschi proposes with a wooden model, something like this. And so he's proposing a much pointier dome uh, and uh, a double shell dome with a space in between and supported on ribs. And the biggest innovation was a tension ring to uh, wrap the bottom of the dome in order to manage those thrusts. And so those thrusts that are, are stretching outward that in Hagia Sophia and the Suleimani Mosque uh, are being supported by buttresses and piers. In Florence, the great innovation is using tension something we may get a chance to look at um, in the next week. But uh, a, a pure circle is extremely weak. Uh, what Brunelleschi does is he creates this pointed geometry by the one-fifth of the span uh, using that with the help of National Geographic. Um, and the base was already built, and it was not quite accurately built. The real challenge was the scaffolding. If you had to build scaffolding from the ground all the way up, it would have taken a, a vast forest and an extra several decades. So Brunelleschi's big uh, innovation was not just the shape, not just the double, not just the ribs, not just the ring, but also his strategy for the scaffolding. And so here we see the ribs inside. These are masonry ribs. Uh, he also invents a crane. Uh, for many years, Leonardo da Vinci got credit for inventing this crane, but he was simply sketching Brunelleschi's invention, and historians were giving him credit for coming up with the crane. Uh, here you see the construction of the lantern, which is the last thing that happens. The piers are massive, and it creates an octagon, which makes it uh, a little bit more complex. Here's the scaffolding. The scaffolding is resting on the drum of the dome here, and so you skip the process of constructing scaffolding up to the base of the drum. This was the single biggest innovation uh, that allowed Brunelleschi to achieve what he was able to achieve. 
Here comes the mystery. This is the part that people still don't understand. This complex herringbone pattern spiraling up uh, of millions of bricks that would grow at a rate of about one foot a year. Yes, isn't that cute? Thank you, National Geographic. And so uh, there, this is still a mystery. The competition was so fierce between Giberti and Brunelleschi, Brunelleschi uh, that Brunelleschi made sure that he never wrote down how it is that he planned on doing this. So there is no record. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, the, the competition jury was a little skeptical of Brunelleschi. He was so young and inexperienced. So instead of awarding the, the contract to Brunelleschi on his own, they jointly awarded it to Giberti and Brunelleschi. And so for years, they were getting joint credit and joint payment until finally Brunelleschi got fed up and he pretended to be ill. And uh, they, the workman would go to Giberti and say, well, what do we do? And Giberti had to admit he didn't have a clue. And so as a result of this competition and the secrecy, we are still speculating on how it is this whole thing came to pass. Um, the lantern was fully worked out uh, by Brunelleschi, but it wasn't built by the time of his death, so uh, uh, his protege continued with the process of the lantern. The lantern was very much involved in uh, the attempt to establish Florence as the New Jerusalem. Um, here you see the, the combination of masonry and wood chains that are connecting in another masonry ring. So these rings were the places, the interlocking masonry is what controlled those outward thrusts. Um, Genoa takes over uh, for a time as the center of finance and trade before it, they get usurped by Antwerp and then Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, but here you see the banking building that gets built in Genoa. Uh, during this time uh, of the Renaissance, and we're giving a lot of uh, very short shrift to the Renaissance in this course, uh, there is a big debate whether the Renaissance was really a thing. Uh, I'm firmly of the opinion that it was definitely a thing, and uh, it wasn't just a creation of the later debates uh, uh, of the 19th century. Uh, it really was a thing, but it was slightly different than the way it's portrayed in, in the way I was taught it in this room. Um, that the, it was a social, to a large extent, it was a social modernization uh, from these family clan towers of comp competing families within a town, this is San Gimignano in Tuscany, to the public, this, for the first time you have the rise of the public, this idea of the public, separate from family. You had individuals who were free to move from town to town, whereas previously uh, you were basically captive of the family fortress because if you left the fortress, you'd be raped if you were a woman, killed if you were a man. Um, but now you get a sense of public order with the rise of police, prisons, courts, um, merchants, exchanges, uh, and public space. And the quintessential public space is the campo uh, in Siena. Uh, a location of public ritual, of horse races. Each district got its zone um, as part of this ritual reenactment. A word about Brunelleschi, um, a final word about Brunelleschi is he really uh, perfected this interpretation of classical order you see in the Foundling Hospital, one of my favorites. Uh, just the lightness and the purity of it, the geometric, and it wasn't just the object of it, but again, as we saw in the Alhambra, it was a formal spatial arrangement, the framing of the space, the strict geometry that orders the entire space. Um, the dome remains a mystery and unsurpassed. No one has achieved this. We'll see the Pantheon, which is uses concrete. We, the Romans were excellent builders of concrete, but we forgot to write down the recipe and forgot it until the 19th century, so no concrete. Um, 
here we see St. Peter's, as we saw before, um, the Mughal architecture we'll be looking at. St. Paul's Cathedral in London that we saw uh, does not come close to Brunelleschi's dome and the Capitol building, uh, even though it uses steel or cast iron at that point. Um, the Capitol dome of the U.S. doesn't do the job. Uh, we're going to skip our Savon Aurora. But here we see uh, the big picture of, of European and Asian trade is that the spices are flowing across the Indian Ocean, up through the Red Sea, uh, into the Mediterranean, uh, to places, first Venice, then Genoa. Uh, and then the Portuguese find a way around it and uh, really dominate for the longest time. So an abbreviated trip to the exception. Uh, in the Tokugawa shogunate comes into power in Japan after a period of competition, and uh, they get quite uh, offended by the revolutionary foment caused by the Portuguese Jesuits. Remember them? And so they ban foreigners, uh, except for the Dutch, because the Dutch helped them. And so they isolate the country and become a totally inward-looking, insular enclave of cultural development. They, they fold in on themselves, looking at their arts. This is the, um, the fourth site, is Katsura Imperial Villa, outside of Kyoto. Actually, now it's in Kyoto, Japan. And it's a garden summer palace retreat not for an emperor, although later it was expanded so that the family could invite the emperor to come visit. Um, and it is this gem of uh, Japanese culture, uh, of a combination of Shinto, Shinto and Zen traditions that gives uh, veneration to the practice of, uh, of calm ceremony with the absence of distraction. Again, unlike uh, the, the Muslims, they're not uh, creating a shimmering surface. They're creating a material reality that uh, it's important to get in touch with. Um, going through the attributes that you're going to see on the, uh, the lecture sheet, we see this modularity of ordering of space. Everything is based on the three foot by six foot tatami modular unit both horizontally and vertically. And so there's this volumetric modularity to the space um, that, is, that orders the whole thing. There is also a pinwheel rotation composition where the direction of the mats themselves are allowed to shift in direction. And there is a similar complementary pinwheel orientation of the assemblage of spaces. You see um, the ability to reorganize the spaces by a system of moving panels. Uh, the shoji screens are the exterior panels, and fush um, fusama screens are these internal panels. And so spaces can be divided and subdivided to create storage areas. Uh, you see the, uh, the stacking shelves. Of, uh, that are called katsura shelves. Uh, and you see these different levels, both in the shelving, they use different levels to organize the few objects that are permitted to disturb the space. But you also see these shifting levels of the floor and of the ceiling uh, in multiple complex ways to create a hierarchy of space. And so it is really a three-dimensional puzzle of interlocking spaces that interlock uh, both inside and outside. And so again, you have this example of architecture has left the building uh, in a very uh, powerful way in this example. And the outside uh, is also invited in. There's this framing of views. And the, uh, the organization of the architecture, the interior design, and the landscape design throughout the site are all carefully composed to create these carefully framed views.
And it's not simply the landscape outside, but it's also the screen painting on the interior treatment. Um, the interlocking of space is not just a spatial thing, but it's also embedded in the joinery. Every type of joint, like we saw in the Javanese example, uh, has a uh, meaning associated with the spiritual practice. Again, the, um, the, the katsura shelves, which were in an innovation here, uh, of stacking complex um, interlocking of these elements. And the, the maintenance of the uh, elements in their close to their natural condition. Many of the structural elements have the bark left on them. The thatch is very much straight from the fields and cut in place. And so there's a sense of Zen practice uh, in the construction of these in staying as close to nature as possible. Uh, the landscaping is part of the design. Uh, unlike what we're used to, where you, uh, you, are, you buy a piece of land, you bulldoze it, and you plant grass, and now you say, OK, what kind of a house do I want? Well, this was anything but that. This, as carefully designed as the house is, the landscape gets an equal degree of attention. The paths uh, are part of the experience. Uh, the framing, again, we saw this in the Alhambra. This is like the Alhambra in that there are a series of axial experiences to framed thresholds. And you pass through the threshold, and the material treatment of the ground plane changes. Uh, and you no longer have the axial path. You now have a meandering path where you can't walk like this anymore. You have to put your head down as you go into stepping stones. And when you arrive someplace, a view has been prepared for you. You arrive at a piece of paving that uh, you don't have to watch where you're walking anymore. You step onto it, and you lift your head. And oh, the view is framed for your enjoyment. And so it's a very carefully choreographed experience. Uh, here, nature being tamed by man-made processes, the earthen bridges across the water element, the importance of the water is fundamental in this case as well, a different way than the Alhambra. The tale of Genji is one of the greatest works of literature ever. A, a woman author of the Hainan court is writing for other women readers of the Hainan court. So full of intrigue, very complex characters who were because you're not allowed to use names. You simply refer to people's roles. Uh, but it is a, a great work of literature. And the reason the owner of this and the builder of this palace uh, builds the palace is because it, he has access to a piece of land on the Katsura River. So the entire thing is a tribute to the uh, atmosphere and experience created by the tale of Genji. Um, the, the tea pavilions are the place, the stage set upon which the tea ceremony of Zen practice is uh, performed. Uh, the kitchen, every aspect of the kitchen, it's simplified um, in this pure formation, the deep thatch sewn in section. It's on the outskirts of Kyoto that was a model of the Chang'an Empire. Uh, and the, the isolation of Japan at this point that allows such a self-indulgent, insular, inward-looking development of the culture is in part reinforced by Keeping foreigners out, if, if a foreigner sets foot on the soil of Japan, they are sentenced to death. And keeping the Japanese from leaving. If any Japanese person were to attempt to leave, they are also sentenced to death. The ships, by law, have to have a hole in the hull, which makes it, as soon as they encounter the waves of an ocean, it will fill up and sink it immediately. So. The Dutch were the only ones with access to ships, and they were only allowed to uh, pass across that one bridge. Final epilogue note that when Bruno Tau escapes Nazi Germany in 1933, he goes to Japan. He visits the Katsura Palace. He spends a great deal of time sketching and meditating and taking it all in and brings it to European modernism. Uh, similar to what Frank Lloyd Wright did through his exposure to Japan. And 
And also we saw Bruno Taut and his involvement in Turkey, in Ankara, where he lived out his final days. And so it's a, the, the Katsura Palace would have been forgotten if not for modernism uh, resurrecting its, the purity of its practices, especially Arado Izozaki, who wrote uh, the book that really put it back on the radar. Sorry about the uh, speed. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Alhambra. Suleimanie. Florence Cathedral. And Katsura. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much.